Uh, thanks so much, Adrian. I really appreciate that. And uh, as, as he said, I'm Nick Selby. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about... Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, third-party risk and how we all deal with it. And I think most of us will know uh, if you're if you're in the security business at all, um, we're we're not doing a particularly good job at it, um, and it's it's something that we all have to go through every time somebody in our organization buys something. So this is um, uh, it's a new way of looking at it. I, I was trying to blow out of the water some of the paradigms, if you'll forgive me, uh, that that I've seen uh, at work. Uh, I'm the chief security officer for a, f a financial services company. Um, and I uh, want to start with the tale of a store of a of a company, Optimize. Uh, this is run by my my friend Thomas. It's uh, Halvar Flake, and uh, he called me. We we were just having a chat. I don't know five six months ago, and he was saying, you know, I I wrote I wrote the agent in a in a memory safe language. It it can only send data. It can't receive anything. Uh, everything that they do. Uh, I mean, it, you know, it's as close to reproducible bills as you can possibly get. Everything is signed by a UTF touch. Uh, every, all the pull requests are signed by the reviewer, also cryptographically uh, attested. And all of the source code is available by the customer. You can, you know, you, you don't have to go through any dance at all. They'll just happy to show it to you. They, they look at this as a selling point of their product. And he was having some real challenges because he could not get companies to look at his product because he didn't have a SOC 2. That's insane. That is absolutely insane. And it, it's also against both the letter and the spirit of what a SOC 2 is. It's a SOC 2 is supposed to be an external attestation that you have evidence of, of your claimed controls. It is not supposed to be a gating factor, but most people in uh, most of the procurement weasels we've run into have made SOC 2 into some kind of a magic uh, a magic attestation, a magic piece of paper. That's really not what it is. Um, so I want to bring us back to, to what it is that we're doing. Like, why is it that we are even asking people for these, uh, for these attestations? What are we trying to solve when we say third-party risk, when we say supply chain risk, which I think are, you know, essentially the same thing. It just depends on where in your, where in your ecosystem you are and the thing you're consuming is. Um, but, you know, essentially it's I'm buying something from somebody else and I don't know if they've taken any care at all to protect my data by protecting their data. So uh, this brings us back to 1984 when Ken Thompson in his in his seminal work that, you know, it's this every engineer knows this, right? You can't trust code. You didn't totally create yourself. That's the the standard. That's the gold standard. Um, and I, I kind of look at this a uh, hundred years ago, I was a sound engineer and there is a rule in sound engineering that, you know, you, you, the optimal number of microphones to ever use is two. And of course you never only use two microphones. And of course you, you don't only use code that you, that you create yourself, but you try to come back to that as a, as a first principle. So let's talk about first principles and what, what it is that we're, we're, we're talking about, especially because supply chain risk is top of the pops and, and climbing Mount Hype this year. Uh, let, let's talk about it. So companies are exposed to supply chain risk by software as a service. That's just, that's what happens. There's, there's other things. There's obviously our, our computer hardware and everything, but most modern companies are, are exposed to it by SaaS. Most of the things that we buy with SaaS are commodity tools. And commodity tools are very misleading because when we think of commodity, we sort of think that, oh, well, you know, that's really simple. We don't really have to care that much. It's just, it's just uh, email. It's really important that as security professionals and as compliance people and as legal people, we understand that commodity doesn't mean it's unimportant. It just means that it's commodity. It means that there's a lot of competition. It means that the price of it is relatively low. It means that we have a great deal of selection. There's a lot of competition in the market. And, uh, but, but commodity stuff certainly can be very important, right? Real-time chat, single sign-on, uh, expense management, all your productivity, your email, video conference that we're on right now, right? These are all commodities. There's lots of places to get these things. And I would say that, as everybody here knows, like we, we, we talked about 
some of the challenges of mounting a conference in today's environment, and one of it is Zoom fatigue. It's real. Um, so if, if there is such a thing as Zoom fatigue, it means we're using Zoom so much that it's got to be important. It's the, it's the foundation. It's the plumbing of, of how we actually do business since the unpleasantness began. And if something's tickling in the back of your mind, yeah, we've had breaches in, you know, Zoom. We've had breaches, and, and these things have been really, really serious breaches of commodity SaaS stuff, right? All of these things in SaaS are places not that we should look at as commodities, but places where we store our business plans, the treasure map to what it is that we do for a living, the treasure map to all of the things. Like, we know that... Uh, most most organizations, uh, and I'm sure Ken can say this as a, as a pen tester, um, most organizations don't know what their crown jewels are. Most organizations don't know where their crown jewels are, but your SaaS products know where your crown jewels are, and your SaaS products can help people find your crown jewels. Uh, we also store our confidential conversations in there. We get so used to saying things uh, in Slack. We get so used to saying things in email that we don't even think anymore as to whether we should be saying things in those channels, right? And of course, we are also keeping masses of our customers' private information in there. And it's a chain of trust that goes from the customer to us, to our SaaS, our SaaS providers, to their SaaS providers, to their third-party hosts and their third-party uh, contractors, their third-party services. This is, you know, when we talk about supply chain risk, it really is a chain. So some time ago, um, the procurement weasels I mentioned earlier and, uh, and uh, the insurance people and the lawyers are like, well, we should, we should start looking at these third-party risks and we should do it in a way that is systemic, systematic and, uh, and, and make sense and let's make a playbook. And a lot of these things are driven not by the, the, the actual risk teams, but, but, but by procurement teams or by compliance reporting up to those and they're based on a runbook. Um, and they're, what they're, they're doing, I believe, is a fundamentally flawed idea, which is, is what I'm just about to buy only as bad or any better than we are, right? It's, you know, it, we understand how secure we are. We have accepted our level of risk. So anything that we buy should be at our same level of risk or better. And that's the, the principle that they have done it and, and uh, that they have based this third-party risk methodology on. And I believe that that's not the right way to do it because as I said, we understand our third-party risk, but we don't understand, even if we turn out, if it turns out that theirs is about the same, you know, it's like mobile phone providers. They all suck. They just suck differently. And we're not sure exactly how differently they suck until, you know, we're in the register. Think also about how we bring these assessment teams in. So if you're anything like anybody else, um, a business team or a discipline within your organization says, you know, we've got this problem and we need to find something that can help us uh, get over this problem. And so that owner, uh, that, that discipline, that team, uh, they set the deliverables and it's usually a business team. And they're like, okay, we need something that will do the following things. And so they start going out and they're looking at Gartner, Gartner quadrants and, you know, Forrester waves and 451 stuff. And they're, they're trying to figure it out. They're looking at magazine articles and they, they get it down, hopefully from the entire universe of things that do this to a list of three. And then once they get the list of three, they get basic contact stuff from uh, and they give it to the legal team. And then once that looks okay, that's when compliance and InfoSec is brought in. Like the decision's already been made that we want SaaS product X. And now it's up to the InfoSec and compliance teams to say, no, that's not acceptable. Um, and, it, and it's also uh, odds are, if you're anything like everybody else, that the engineering team, which actually has data that they know where it is and they know how they're protecting it and they understand the ebb and flow of how data moves through your networks, they are not consulted at all. This is really seen as a business problem that's dealt with by business units and then it's legal and then, oh yeah, you guys can do your, your little compliance thing and let's just hurry up and do it. And of course, we're only given you know a very short amount of time to, to do it. And it's got to be a showstopper. I mean, like, you know, the building has to be on fire before anybody's going to listen to the compliance or security team at this point, because now everybody is bought in. 
that's insane. And so what we send out is usually a spreadsheet and it is the spreadsheet from hell. It is often hundreds of questions. And these questions have been developed. I don't even know when it seems like they were developed in the 1990s um, because they're asking questions about things that most people, especially most SaaS products don't have firewalls. They don't have data centers. They don't have hard drives, but we're asking seriously scores of questions about nineties era, you know, like I'm sure that there's questions in there about token ring and like, we, we don't have most of these things, but that those are the spreadsheets that we get. Those are the spreadsheets that we send. This means that we have reduced the concept of trust to a checklist that really has nothing to do with trust at all. And that I think is something that we need to change. And I think that we're all doing that because we're all bought into the system and we all need to buy things. And when we need to buy things, we're actually getting good at this, right? We're getting good at finding the ways to get through these things. And I would submit to you all that getting through it is not the purpose. Just getting through it is a really bad, unhealthy, complacent way to do business. So, what we really want to do, I think, is learn the difference between, you know, somebody did due diligence on Solar Wind, somebody did due diligence on uh, on CodeCov, and and when they did that, they got answers to questions. So one of the things that I'd like to do is go back historically and start to see what's the difference between, you know, the stuff that we did that got breached and the stuff that we did uh, that didn't get breached as third-party risk, but that's a, a bad way too. And that's a, that's a, that's a false sense of, of comfort because just because they haven't been breached or just because we don't know that they've been breached doesn't mean that they're safe and it doesn't mean that they won't be breached. So, the, but the, the, and, and this has been the point of the exercise. And, and I think that that's actually a false way to look at this too. There, there is no spreadsheet cat rodeo that has surfaced this risk. No spreadsheet saw this. And if it did, because if you take a look at who got owned by CodeCov, who got owned by, by SolarWinds, these are some of the best companies in the world. These are some of the biggest companies in the world. When, when you hear that FireEye, which is, you know, they know a thing or two about intrusion. When they're getting owned, their, their spreadsheets aren't doing it. But we're, we are actually bringing the enemy within. And I think a great part of this and a great part of getting through it is that when you look at these things, everybody who fills these things in knows that the answer to every question should be yes. And if you say no, it's gonna, it's gonna, raise, uh, it's gonna raise eyebrows at the raised eyebrows department. Um, so you know, now what we have is not just a spreadsheet of irrelevant stuff, but we have a spreadsheet of irrelevant stuff all answered yes in order to get past the procurement weasels. And I want to say a little bit more about that. The procurement weasels are often not the auditors, the guys who are looking at this. I mean, yeah, they've got the experience of looking at a thousand spreadsheets like this one, but often they don't have security subject matter expertise, or maybe they've got a master's certificate in, in information security, right? But they're not practitioners. They don't understand what this means. They're not understanding what the answers mean, right? And so the auditors who are looking at the answers don't have subject matter expertise. And often, and I mean really often, and especially with SOC, these are questions that are written by accountants. So you've got accountants writing questions for auditors to judge cybersecurity. Okay, as, as, as Vlad said, what is to be done? I, I am here to propose a, a new way of doing this and it's slightly different and, and it will, um, I think, throw people a little bit out of whack at the beginning, um, but I've been doing this for about a year and I think it works fairly well. And I'm not saying that we don't have any third-party risk. I'm saying that we understand, all of us understand what it is going in a little bit better than we used to. So we ask questions up front um, in, in that thing where people are looking at Gartner, uh, Gartner Magic Quadrants and things. Um, before we even start doing a features assessment of those, those final three in the Bake Off, that's when we're asking questions. We set up a, a preliminary speed bump right at the front there. Now, this must be a bump, right? It can't be a questionnaire. It can't be a long thing because, you know, the company is not going to get involved in this. The company you're, you're talking to, they won't fill in something until they're relatively sure that they're pretty far down the sales cycle, down, down the funnel, right? But we also want my teams, we want our business people to not waste their time looking at something that's potentially unsuitable and building up all of, all of their inherent bias 
to, to, towards something before we've actually had a chance to understand whether there's any showstoppers, right? So I say a speed bump, it can't be any more than 10 questions. You really can do this with five questions because you're not trying to do a whole due diligence. You will do a due diligence later and you can even use the cat rodeo to do that later. But what you're trying to understand before you do that and get past the compliance stuff, you really want to understand how these people think about security, right? So these questions, in order to do this, they have to be proxies for security. And that's what's most important. It doesn't really matter what the questions are, as long as from the answers and from the way the answers are given, we can see what they think security means. What does security mean to SaaS provider A? That's what we're trying to answer. Do they care about this as much as we do, right? So, you know, one of those would be like, do you encrypt all of our data in transit and at rest in your systems? Is all our data separate from everybody else? If they're there, if they're able to say yes to that really quickly, that's really not bad. And that, that will tell you that they've, that they've thought things out and they've architected at least for contemporary SaaS. And that's, that's a pretty good thing. Um, and if the answer is no, it, it, this should not be a yes or no. This should be a, 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 an open field. Like, tell us about it. Tell us what's going on. And if they just say yes, that's fine. But if they say no, but, then look at what the but is. And maybe they've got a good answer because I've seen good answers to this question that is not just yes. Um, and similarly, you want to let people in and say, like, tell me about your architecture. Tell me about the segregation of data within your S3 buckets or your blobs. What I'm looking for there is, have you thought about uh, your S3 buckets suddenly becoming public? Have you thought about your, your blobs, uh, the access to your blobs and how people can get access to it? Is it going to show up in Shodan? Is it going to show up someplace where people are looking for it? Just talk to me about it and give me a few words. And what this also does is it makes it so that those those weasels who usually answer spreadsheets, they will have to get an engineer. They will have to get somebody from a discipline that understands what the question is to answer the question. So now you're actually going to get a question that, that has a meaningful answer. Same, same idea, describe your internal authentication regime. Now I know what we're looking for, right? We're looking for none of our things are exposed to the internet. You have to go through a bastion. You have to go through a, a VPN. You can't get into the VPN unless you go through our single sign-on with multi-factor. You can't get to our single sign-on unless you're going through something like Cloudflare. Like what we're looking for is multi-layer, single sign-on, no static creds. We're looking for a good story around internal authentication. And by saying it just like this, you give them the opportunity to do that. Similarly, right, what, what, tell us how you maintain least privilege. It makes them get the people who are setting this up because this is a, a, a nuanced question. And the answer to this question will give you a real sense of what they're thinking about when they're setting up their networks. This one, um, this one I think is very important, especially if we're, if we're taking a look at anything that touches our code, right? Is anything using static credentials and how, do you, how are you sure that there aren't static credentials. What, like, what are you doing, right? And, and that question's related to how do you manage secrets? And here, we really want to see something enterprise grade. We, we, we want to see HashiCorp Vault. We want to see Amazon Key Manager. We, we want to see something that, that shows that they've actually got a sense. And, and we don't care what the technology is. We just don't want to see that, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're giving everybody the same, the same login to our open VPN, and then they come in and everything is fine because it's through a VPN. Right? So, so how do you manage secrets? We're looking for them to tell us a story. This one I never thought would be so important until I saw some of the answers to this question. Uh, a named executive responsible for security, what's their title? I have seen companies say, yes, we have a named executive responsible for security and they are the chief software developer or they are the VP of engineering. That's not a named executive responsible for security. That's a named executive in charge of everything. And to whom do they report gives you a really good sense. If it's a, C, if it's a CISO um, or a CSO reporting to um, the CIO, that's different. I'm not saying better or worse. I'm just saying different from a CISO reporting to legal or a CISO reporting to audit or a CISO reporting to the CEO. Right, where, where do they come in the organization? What, are you, what can you glean about their organization based on where the CISO reports and what organization they report up to? Maybe the CISO reports to the VP of engineering, fine, but they got to report somewhere. And so, so this question is actually quite telling. There is, um, 
a real need for, for policies. And I've seen a lot of answers to this that surprised me of big companies that I would have expected. And a lot of times what you'll get is companies saying, well, we have an information security policy and we have a data security policy, but they're confidential and we won't show them to you. Oh, really? What are we doing? Espionage? Like, come on. Like, why, why can't we see it? Get an answer that you are satisfied with. Um, I, I don't, I really don't believe in the operational security of, of a security policy, uh, you know, unless you are doing something in the military industrial complex, you are doing something that has a, you know, you're in a very targeted industry. Like if you're, if you're getting into bed with somebody and buying something and you're a significant customer placing significant trust in somebody, you'd like to know that they have a password policy that, that is, you know, uh, acceptable or better that they have a non-password policy that they are passwordless. Like I'd like to see what it is. I'd also like to see their physical security policies, not because I'm worried about how people get into their data center. Cause everybody's in, you know, everybody's in Google or, or Microsoft or, or Amazon, but I would like to know what they think about physical security at the office and how they enforce that. This question gets no's more often than ever, or they'll say, yes, you know, we, we, we have them uh, do stuff on their own. Um, actually, you know, even 10 minutes a month of formalized security, uh, secure coding training is really important and you'll find better results. Um, you, when, you, when, you do, when you get a no to this, you'll often find that, that pen tests will have, uh, you know, cross-site scripting and, and like, you know, <laughs> you, you, you've got code red running around their data center because like, th if they're not doing this, they're not doing so many other things. Um, so this could be a showstopper. I'm not suggesting that any of these questions are necessarily showstoppers, but I'm saying you can start to decide once you have a better sense of how they think about security. This one is a, this one's problematic. I would like to get here. What I'm trying to understand is what they think about their, um, their software development life cycle, their, their CICD pipeline. And I will say this, like really the question that I want to ask and the question that I think that you should be asking. And the best questions I get um, as a CISO, can any engineer in your organization take a laptop and deploy something to prod? Or do they have to go through your CICD pipeline? The answer to that is, is probably the most telling answer that you're going to get out of a 300 question questionnaire. Like that, that tells you everything you need to know right there. So there is something called Salsa. Um, you want to check it out. It's at salsa.dev. It's the, it's the way Google does code. And when I say reproducible, you know, I would assume that Halvar's company that I showed you at the beginning is somewhere between level three and level four. Um, you want to see people up there. Level two is fine. I mean, like all, even getting, getting to level one is really good. You'll see a lot of companies out there selling SaaS stuff that aren't even at level one. So you, you want to figure out where they are. The only problem that I have with this is that it's not, this is a brand new framework. And, you know, we've been using it for, I don't know, six or eight months, I think, but um, a lot of companies don't even know that it exists. So it's really a difficult, it's, it's, a, it's a standard that, that hasn't gotten out there. Whatever, whatever way you have of asking about your CICD pipeline, starting with that question that I asked you, that, that's probably a really good place to start to understand the sanctity of their CICD pipeline. And that, that is where, that's the, 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 uh, the goal of that question. So I'm probably at time. Uh, here's the, the sort of high level of what it is that I just said. Um, I, I call this a PISA. It's a preliminary information security assessment. It's security questions before you start the bake-off. It's security questions that stop your people from bringing you a steaming pile of turd at the end of a bake-off and saying, here, this is the beautiful thing that we, will, that we want. And everybody there has got confirmation bias because they know that this is the product that they want and there shall be no others. And now your job in security or compliance is to say no when no one wants to hear a no. It's much better to say no when nobody cares. So do the pizza and, and do it up front. You obviously still need due diligence. This is not going to uh, get rid of your due diligence process. And you want your due diligence process for a year and a half from now when your auditor comes in and asks you to show them that you did due diligence on this because now they know that third-party risk and supply chain risk is top of the pops. So they're going to be asking to see all of your due diligence. So you're still going to need the spreadsheets from hell. It's just that you won't care that much about their answers because you'll already have really what you care about before they've even started talking. Um, so all you're looking really to do, just like in any intelligence exercise, you're not trying to compile all the list of things you care about. You're trying to throw away all the things you don't care about. You're trying to disqualify people before they even get into consideration. Um, <clears throat> remember that SOC 2 
sock one, sock three. These are not free passes. This is not a qualifier. Um, but, and the lack of it is in the disqualifier. So I will give you a great example of when uh, it is not a disqualifier because most, you know, most contemporary companies should have a sock two. The thing is you need to be around for a year before you can have one, right? So take a look at Halvar's company. They're very secure. They're doing everything that you'd want a vendor to do. So if they tell you, we don't have a SOC 2 yet, but we're in the process of getting it, ask them to use the Vendor Security Alliance core questionnaire. I think it's 60 questions. Um, you can get it free at, at vendorsecurityalliance.org. They download the core. Don't do the full unless, they, unless you get some questions in the core that you really think are you know need, need better digging. But get them to do the core. There's your due diligence spreadsheet. Now you don't have to agonize over a spreadsheet. VSA updates it, I think, every year or two. Um, so you know, if they don't have a SOC 2, get some kind of self-attestation. Uh, ask to see their pen test reports from a, uh, uh, from a uh, trustworthy pen test company. Uh, even the executive summary will often tell you a lot. And then if you see something alarming in there, you can ask the question. Look for sensible answers. Just ask questions that are proxies for do these people care about security? And that way you can stop the cat sheet, the, the spreadsheet cat rodeo. And thank you very much for your time. There is my email, nick at fuzztechnology.com. Always happy to answer questions on Twitter. I am fuzztech. And thanks so much, Adrian. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it.